Welcome back, everyone. Today, I was playing in the Losers Bracket Final of the Chessable Masters, which is part of the Champions Chess Tour being held on chess.com. Now, as you guys know, I lost a very tough match against Fabiano, but today I would be playing either the winner of the match between Levon Aronian or Magnus Carlsen. Now, Magnus simply blew Levon away, won his match, which set up the final in the Losers Bracket that everyone wanted to see between myself and Magnus Carlsen. Now, before we get to that, you guys, I came in today with a motto, as you can tell from my t-shirt, which is, I literally don't care. So let's dive into the action. First game, I'm starting with the white pieces against Magnus. I played this move E4. And here, Magnus plays C6, essaying the Karo Khan. I play Knight F3, D5, and D3 here. Now, this is what I played on day one against Vladimir Fedosev. Um, probably not the best choice objectively against an endgame wizard like Magnus. Widely considered to be one of the best, if not the best, endgame player in the history of the game. Nonetheless, I didn't really want to prepare something, waste time. You know, I want to keep my mind fresh and everything else. So that's this is what I chose to do. So Magnus trades the queens. He goes knight f6, and now I play this move knight bd2. Now, knight bd2 is not the best move. Knight fd2 is better. But I did have a game very recently, I think, against Rasmus Savane. Um, or Matthias Bluebaum, one of the one of the two German grandmasters, where they played this very creative move G5, and I struggled to prove an advantage. Eventually, I think I did win the game, but it was very very difficult, so I didn't want to repeat that. So I played knight bd2, Magnus plays g6, I go knight e1 here, trying to route my knight to the center of the board, because on f3, it's not really targeting anything. And when I go knight e1, I can jump towards d3, where I can hit the c5 and e5 squares, but I can also play f3, creating a nice pawn chain, where later on, I can then move my knight to b3 and develop this bishop, and it's just a very nice position to play. So here, Magnus plays this move, bishop h6, a very, very good move, because if you put the bishop on g7, it's staring at a diagonal that's probably going to be closed after c3, whereas when you play bishop h6, if I ever move the knight, black will just trade the bishops. Now, disregarding the fact that the pawn on e4 is hanging here, just in general, with less pieces on the board, it's going to be very hard for me to create winning chances. So here I play f3 to create the connect four i win the game of course unfortunately this is chess so i don't but i play f3 magnus goes bishop e6 and now i play b3 now the best move and the move that computers like is knight to b3 but once again after bishop takes c1 king takes c1 and a move like knight bd7 knight d4 and say knight f8 i didn't really see how i can be that much better here it's a symmetrical pawn structure all the pawns are on the same files queens are off the board a set of bishops are off the board i just didn't really see it so I decide to play b3 here, trying to fianchito my own bishop. Magnus castles, I go bishop b2, rook d8, and now I play knight d3 to prevent black from winning one of these knights. So Magnus plays c5, and here I go f4, and he plays his move knight c6. Now knight c6 is not a bad move, but I was actually really concerned about this move b5 with the idea of going c4 here. If I take the juicer on c5, black takes on f4, and after, say, knight d3, black can simply go back with ideas like knight g4 and knight to e3, maybe even just simple development like knight c6, b4, and black's pieces are all very well developed, and meanwhile I have a king and two rooks and a bishop that are just not in the game here. So, Magnus plays knight to c6, I play g g3, not blah, 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 g3 here, creating the classic connect 3 this way. Now, the reasoning behind creating this connect 3 is that now the bishop on h6 is fairly ineffective because it's simply staring at a pawn chain, so it's not an active piece. Magnus plays c4, I take with the pawn, and now he plays this move knight to a5. Here I go e5, he goes knight d7, and now I've created a second connect 4. That's got to count for something, right? Two connect 4s in one game, I mean, what more can you ask for? So I play c5 here, Magnus goes rook c8, I play bishop d4, creating the classic wooden shield in the middle of the board. It's worth noting, of course, that in this position, I am simply up one pawn, but this pawn is a very weak doubled pawn on c5, so it isn't that much. When you combine that with my king, my bishop, and my two rooks being on, on the back rank, it really can't be all that good for me. So Magnus goes b6, I take... He takes with the knight. Now I play this move, bishop f2. Now, based on what happened in the game, I should have simply taken on b6 right away and played rook to b1 here. Black is still a little bit better, but I think white can probably save the game. So instead, I play this move, bishop f2, which is a horrible move. Now, Magnus plays this move, bishop f5, and as, as we can see from the evaluation bar, and as I actually was realizing during the game, this move knight to a4 is very, very scary here, because even though these knights are on the rim, they're coming into the game very, very quickly, and again, I have four pieces that are underdeveloped. These rooks are on two open files, and all my pieces are just kind of jumbled up in this hot mess. So at this point, I was very concerned, but Magnus goes bishop f5, and now I decide to keep my wits about me, 
trade on b6 and play rook b1 now the reason that this is important to note is now what I'm aiming for is not to win the game but to try and simplify get as many pieces off the board because currently I have one extra pawn so if I can keep trading Knights and Bishops there's no chance of me losing the game so here Magnus goes Knight c4 which is still reasonable I don't necessarily think it's the best move but black keeps some pressure we trade the Knights I go rook takes pawn on b6 and now I'm up two pawns but again I still have a Bishop a rook and a King that are not in the game so Magnus plays rook a4 I play bishop to e2 here he goes pawn to e6 and now I play this move h4 now this is a very important move as well because if I don't play this move pawn to h4 black is going to play g5 next move and ruin my pawn my pawn structure so if I play rook to b2 and black goes g5 here even though I'm still up two pawns here on the edge this pawn on e5 is very weak these bishops are very powerful in the center and both of black's rooks are active and, and even rook a8 is a big threat here to win the pawn on a2 and if anything black is is better here so in this position I play h4 to stop this g5 pawn push and keep my pawn chain intact Magnus plays bishop f8 and now I go king d2 and he plays bishop b4 now I was hoping Magnus would take the pawn on a2 here because after I get this other rook to b1 now my rooks are in the game my king is fine I can play rook b8 trade off these rooks and in general I shouldn't really be in any danger here so Magnus goes bishop b4 I play king to c1 bishop c3 and now I play this move king b1 now it was very clear to me when I was watching the cams during the game because we're in a zoom call and you can see see the other player or the opponent uh that Magnus was surprised by this move it was very clear that he thought this move wasn't playable now I think the reason he assumed this is because after bishop takes knight I think that Magnus only thought about bishop takes bishop and after rook to a we're gonna get a classic lobster pincer checkmate here in the corner or I'm gonna lose a lot of material so say I go king c1 rook takes a2 rook b1 and then rook a1 I can run with the king and lose both of the rooks and lose the game and if I don't do that I just play like bishop e4 black trades and goes rook a1 and as xqc calls it we have the lobster pincer checkmate so in this position it's also worth noting if black plays rook a to try and go for the lobster pincer anyway now I can play knight to c1 guarding the pawn on a2 and white is probably a little bit better here because what I'm trying to do let's just say black plays h5 is go bishop d3 and now I'm going to trade a set of bishops and with the two extra pawns and very limited material I'm going to have great winning chances so here Magnus takes I take with the pawn of course he goes bishop d4 and now I go rook b3 now here rook a does not work so I can play bishop to f3 and after rook to a7 I can play there are a couple options but probably one of the simplest is to go rook h2 laterally guarding the pawn on a2 with this rook on, on the edge and I'm simply up two pawns I'm gonna have great winning chances so Magnus plays bishop d4 I go rook b3 he goes bishop f2 here again rook a8 it's the same thing with bishop f3 and rook to h2 bishop f2 is played and now I go d4 giving up this pawn because it's worth noting right now all these pawns are on the same color as the dark square bishop and so I could very easily lose all of these pawns so I play d4 to, to guard the g3 pawn here and now Magnus plays this very unusual move rook d takes d4 now at this point Magnus was getting a little bit low on time and and he just he, he wanted to try and try and simplify however this is a mistake now whether it's a mistake that loses the game is up for debate someone will have a supercomputer and analyze very deeply but in this position I missed a huge opportunity to play this move rook to f1 now the reason this move is so good is because the rook guards the pawn the rook also covers e3 and the bishop is simply trapped here I'm going to capture this bishop no matter where it moves now what what Magnus probably would have done is he would have taken on g3 given up the bishop and played rook d2 attacking the bishop I cannot move this bishop here which I'd love to to guard the pawn because then he takes the bishop and after I play a move like bishop d1 and rook takes a2 rook b3 rook h2 white is still better you have a bishop for one pawn but my king is very passive you have castle mania on the seventh with these rooks and I'm not really sure that I can do better than eventually getting into some end game like rook and bishop versus rook which would be a technical draw so perhaps I should have played this instead I play this move rook d1 and after rook a to b4 now the game peters out instantly to a draw because after I take Magnus trades the rooks and I, I offered him a draw here because simply after bishop takes rook the way the game would continue is with h5 bishop up two I, I take on g6 g4 bishop g3 I go f5 takes 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 and say king c2 takes bishop f3 f4 king d3 king e2 and this of course leads to a simple draw because I can just move the bishop infinitely and with these double pawns black can never make progress so first game ends in a draw with the white pieces and now we're in the second game where I have the black pieces very very dicey in match situations when you're in the final game of the match and you have to play with black pieces but you just try to stay steady
So Magnus plays d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, and now I play bishop b4, and we have the classic Nimzo Indian defense. Magnus plays e3, I castle, and he goes bishop d2. Now, those of you guys who have been big fans of my channel for a very long time and watching a lot of my recaps, this is a system that I myself have played quite frequently. I played it in the... Um, in the uh, Chess Global Championship against David Navarro. I think I might have also played against Lenier Dominguez. I also played it in the Tata Steel India event at the end of last year against uh, against Parham Magsudalu. So it's always tricky when someone plays a system that you've played yourself with the opposite color. So I decided to play what I felt was the best way to try and, try and force the issue immediately versus simply playing a position. Now, d5 is a very reasonable move, but after, say, takes, takes bishop d3, c6, and knight f3, the game goes on. I mean, white tries to play, or knight g2, white tries to play for, like, f3 and e4, um, and there's no way to simplify all the pieces stay on the board. And against a player like Magnus, you definitely don't want to do that. So I play c5 here. Magnus plays a3. I trade the bishop for the knight. I go knight e4, and now he plays knight e2, trying to develop this knight. If I take and white takes, white still has some central control here. And after, say, d6, after takes, takes, and say, queen c2 with bishop d3, white is significantly better because this op on d3 will target the pawn. White can castle, bring the rooks to the center immediately, and I'm still lacking in development here. So... I decide to play b6 here, trying to fianchito the bishop with bishop b7. Magnus goes d5, and here I play this move rook e8. Now, rook e8 is not the best move. Bishop b7, I think bishop a6. Both of these moves are the standard standard theoretical lines, but I played rook e8 simply because, because during the game, I realized that if Magnus plays f3 here, after takes, 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 if white takes with either the pawn or the queen even, this pawn on e3 is hanging here. So it's kind of tricky because white can't play f3, whereas, say, bishop b7, the normal line is f3 takes takes and now if i take white just takes because the pawn's not under attack here so i try to invert the move order and confuse magnus and it does work out quite well because magnus spent a bit of time here he spent almost four minutes before he plays this move h4 now i don't know the logic behind h4 the way that i rationalize is that either magnus wanted to play like alpha zero or the new age computers where they push p on the edge of the board or he had looked at some line or a similar pawn structure where he'd seen this h4 move being played by the computers so he plays h4 now this move definitely took me back a little bit it's not a move i expected because also it's kind of aggressive like you're creating weaknesses on the king side if you cannot castle your king to the queen side and castling to the king side is pretty difficult to do as well so here i take on d5 magnus takes back with the queen and now i play knight c6 worth noting if white takes with the pawn here now i can simply go bishop a6 and with this, these bishops and this knight it's kind of awkward and you've already started pushing the pawn on the king side and with no obvious attack black should be better so after takes, Magnus plays queen takes. I go knight c6, developing the knight. And now he plays rook to d1. I go queen to e7. And he plays h5 here. And now I go h6. It's worth noting that this is a very important move. If I play a move like bishop h6, or bishop a6, I should say, and white gets this h6, g6 structure, generally based on what we've seen from alpha zero, Lilo, and Leela, and other computer programs, when you get the structure white can push upon or black pushes upon down the board, um, generally it's very, very difficult to play. And in the end games, you tend to have a lot of problems with this pawn structure. So here I play h6, preventing that. Magnus goes queen d3. Now you already have to be somewhat careful here with white because if you play a move like knight to f4 to develop the knight, now I have this bone crusher with knight takes f2, forking d's rooks on d1 and h1. If white takes knight, queen takes e3 is checkmate, game over. I win the match, all the glory is mine. So you do have to be a little bit careful here. Magnus plays this move queen d3. Now the move I was somewhat expecting was rook h3 to laterally guard the pawn against the sacrifice, but it's a very tough move to play and it feels somewhat speculative for a couple of reasons. First of all, I can go bishop b7 and after takes, I can simply trade the queens and go bishop to c8 and win one of these rooks. And Magnus also generally, he, he isn't, he isn't necessarily a tack. I mean, obviously he plays great tactically, but trying to play with tactile themes that are not obvious, like in a position such as this, is very difficult. And rook h3 just even to me intuitively feels wrong. It does not feel like the right move. So Magnus plays queen d3 instead, guarding against the sack on f2 once again. And now I play bishop b7. Now, I play this move very quickly. I don't know if it's the best move, but I felt that at this point I need to develop because if I don't play bishop b7, computer likes rook b8, for example, which I don't even understand because I thought after knight f4, White is getting one of these knights d5 here. And apparently after d6, knight d5, queen g5, I'm just much better. So go figure. What do I know about chess? Um, at any rate, I thought if White was getting a bastion with, and jumping with the knight, I would have some issues to deal with. So I played bishop b7 instead. Magnus takes the pawn on d7. And now I play this very enterprising move, knife to d4. 
Now, after knight to d4, it looks like white can simply trade the queens, take the knight, and white white has an extra bishop on the board. White's just winning the game. But if white plays queen takes e7, I have this beautiful checkmate with knight to c2, and look at d's knights. They checkmate the white king, and this would have been uh, my immortal. Of course, Magnus Carlsen, world champion, he's not into any of those memes, any of that stuff. He's not going to let me have an immortal game against him. So he decides to take the knight with the rook, and he still guards the queen on d7. So now I take the rook, we trade the queens, he takes on d4, and we sort of reach an end game here where white has a bishop and two pawns for the rook. However, white still is lacking in development. You have three pieces that have not come into the game yet, and so there are some chances for me to get an advantage. Magus plays knight to f4. I go knight to d6 here, and now he plays this move f3 after a very long thing. Now, already here, I was becoming very optimistic. So after white plays a move like b3, I can now go b5 trying to win this pawn. And if white takes the pawn on b5, there are a couple ways, a couple ways in which I should be doing very well, but probably the simplest is rook c1 check, king to d2, and then rook e c7, threatening rook c2, threatening knight to e4. There's also a pin on the back rank of the rook and the bishop, and white's pieces are all completely discombobulated, and I should win the game. So that's why here Magnus uses a lot of time and comes up with a very, very good, very, very good and very practical decision. Now, the move he plays is not the best move in the position, but what happens is we end up in this end game where after white gets the king to g3, the computer still likes black's position, but white has a very nice wooden shield with this bishop on d4. It can never be removed, by the way. I don't have pawns on either this e or c file to move and attack the bishop. So white has a planted wooden shield here on d4 and with the bishop in the pawn for the rook and this great knight on f4 which is a bastion because i can never play g5 due to n peasant i'm just i just can't really claim any advantage now this is the other thing that doesn't really we don't see it that often in magnus's games because magnus generally gets great positions out of the opening he's not in a lot of trouble most of the time but he does have this ability that when he's in trouble just flip that switch to where he, he's able to shut it down and he's not he doesn't remain overly optimistic about his position and he just makes a practical decision to get the draw and this is one such example where he started to sense the danger and he just he allows me to win a pawn but he realizes with the wooden shield he's not he doesn't have any problems so here i play rook d7 goes a4 and now i play rook c7 now this this was a silly move of course but at this point already i probably can't win computer like bishop a6 but after say rook to a1 bishop c4 a5 takes takes and a6 while i can claim some kind of advantage here in this position it's hard to see any way to break through the 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 first rank is covered by the white rook I can't double stack on the second rank because the bishop covers the square I can't remove the knight because of en passant and so there just isn't much here I know the computer still prefers black but this should be a drop so after a4 I play rook c7 rook a1 and now I just go back basically admitting I have nothing Magnus plays a5 we trade I go a6 rook a3 and now I just play rook to c8 here and at this point I offered Magnus to draw once again because here white doesn't ever really want to remove the knight from f4 because then I can play rook d5 and go after this pawn on the edge so you don't want to move the knight because it also covers the square if you don't move the knight you can't really attack this pawn it's on the opposite color of, of the of the dark square light bishop and so there just isn't much play for either side so I offer a draw Magnus accepts and we move to our Megadon now for some reason this is at the start of the game however it's not a spoiler Whew, not a spoiler praise praise the Lord sorry about that you guys so headed to our Megadon in our Megadon I bid nine minutes and 17 seconds Magnus bid nine minutes and 27 seconds that means I win the bid and I choose to play with the black pieces so the game starts with c4 here for Magnus keep in mind the result is simple Magnus must win with white if it's a draw or if I win I am through to the to the grand final against Fabiano Caruana so we get c4 Magnus choosing to play the classic explosive opening I go knight f6 he plays knight c3 and I go e5 we get knight f3 knight c6 and now Magnus plays d4 it's worth noting earlier today in his in the semi-final match of the losers bracket he played the same opening against Levon Aronian now I did look at it very very briefly but I was not really expecting it and so I didn't I didn't look at it as much as I should have now in that game I believe Levon played e4 knight d2 bishop b4 e3 takes takes castles and after another really strong move g4 Magnus was just off to the races and he won a very clean game 
So after d4, I trade and I play bishop to b4. He goes g3, castles, bishop g2, rook e8, castles. And here I used a bunch of time before playing this move h6. Now, the reason that I did not play this move, bishop takes c3, is while this is probably the best way to play, after move like knight e5, white can go c5. And on top of the fact that there's no clear cut way for me to go after these double pawns, white ends up with the bishop combo or the bishop pair. And in Armageddon games, if you get the bishop pair, you're going to be able to drag the game on forever. They're not going to be obvious simplifications. And so that's why I chose not to play this move bishop takes c3 instead i play h6 and now magnus goes knight d5 so i can no longer double his pawns on these c4 and c3 squares we trade the knights trade more knights and i go queen to e7 here and magnus plays bishop e3 and now i play this move bishop d6 because what i really need to figure out here is how do i develop this light square bishop I cannot play b6 here because then there's d6 which creates the classic fossil where i lose either the rook on a8 or i lose the queen one of these two pieces is going to fall so if I if I can't go b6 how do I develop the light square bishop now I'd love to play d6 here but then I hang the bishop as well so it's very difficult and if I play bishop a5 white can just go d6 here and after takes takes and rook f d1 this position is absolutely miserable my light square bishop is simply locked in jail and I'm going to lose the game so I decide to play bishop d6 what this does it shuts down the diagonal so there will be no fossils it guards the pawn on c7 and now I can play for b6 and bishop b7 or b6 and bishop a6 and activate my op on that diagonal so Magnus plays rook d1 I go b6 he goes queen d2 I go a5 here now the reasoning behind a5 is that down the road there might be an opportunity where I can put the bishop on c5 and with all these pawns here guarding the bishop I am completely fine so I play a5 it also stops white from playing b4 preventing bishop c5 as well and I just want to go bishop a6 so Magnus plays rook c1 I go rook b8 here not bishop a6 right here by the way because then I thought he could take on c7 although apparently I'm smoking something because after takes bishop takes a8 ah uh, I have bishop b4 attacking the queen I'm attacking the bishop and I'm much better now this I didn't see I didn't want to spend too much time during the game so I tried to avoid hanging something obvious so I go rook b8 Magnus plays bishop f4 and I go bishop a6 activating my light square op or light square bishop on this diagonal Magnus goes e4 we trade I go d6 now I'm guarding the pawn on c7 and I almost have a flying v formation here but this pawn is always going to be a weakness so Magnus plays rook c3 queen d8 rook c1 rook e7 he's got the double stack but I'm holding the pawn and now he expands on the king side with h4 here I go bishop b5 now probably in this position I should have played bishop c8 right away um because when I go bishop b5 which you'll notice that I can't really put the bishop on d7 here because say white plays f3 if I go bishop d7 I hang the pawn on c7 but I really do want the bishop on this diagonal so I should go bishop c8 here and let's just say white plays b3 I can go rook b7 over protect this pawn and now it's a question of how does white push p on the king's side so this would have been much better but instead I play bishop b5 here Magnus plays g4 and now I go f6 and here he makes a big mistake he plays this move g5 now the move itself is not the end of the world but when you're playing in an arm our our mega our Armageddon sorry Armageddon game now I'm getting all the pronunciations confused in my head when you're playing an Armageddon game there's one basic principle you have from the get-go which is that if you're playing with the white pieces you want to keep as many pieces on the board as long as possible and you don't want to simplify into end, end games because you also at some point have to realize that without increment since we're playing no increment you can also flag your opponent if they get too low on time so here I felt that if Magnus had played a move like Queen G3 let's just say I go like Bishop E8 and F4 white has almost a great wall of China here on the fourth rank with these pawns you can push for G5 or E5 I don't have obvious plans I can't push this pawn maybe I can go B5 I can't really push pawns on the King side so I'm I'm in a very bad spot here it's a very passive position and I'm down six minutes on the clock so I think if Magnus had done this he probably wins this game I would say 90 percent or more of the time instead he plays g5 now while this move is still good what it allows me to do is it allows me to sort of get some simplification here to where I'm up a pawn temporarily but pieces are going to come off the board Magnus goes bishop h3 I go bishop d7 he takes and now we have a bunch of trades and I go queen f6 now this is exactly the point even though white is better here material remains even and with only a queen and a rook on the board I'm not going to have many options I'm not going to have many decisions here like I'm going to try to go rook f8 maybe attack the pawn maybe queen f4 maybe queen b2 but that's literally all the counterplay I have here it's queen f4 queen b2 rook f8 or rook e8 that's it so I I can pretty much zero in and focus on on very obvious moves here and not have to waste time thinking about what to do whereas in the previous position just to illustrate it once again in this position what is my move I don't have an obvious move I can't trade pieces I don't have a pawn break where where am I going what am I doing 
So this is why I, I do think this was a big mistake. So we get to this position here after queen f6 magnus plays queen h7 and now i play rook f8 only move here by the way because now i want to move the king create the double stack and attack his king which is also a little bit loose here with only one pawn in front of it so here magnus plays rook c7 now this move i think is a big mistake he probably should have played e5 here and if he had played e5 i think there's a very good chance that i would have blundered and lost the game here by capturing with the queen which is what i had seen during the game and i thought after rook c7 king e8 i was completely fine if white checks i simply go king e7 Rook is guarded, pawn is guarded, and it's all good. I always have queen e1 check as well. However, after king to e8, white has this very nice move, queen c2, creating the double stack, but white also guards the pawn. So if I check and white goes king g2, now the pawn on f2 is guarded, and I'm simply getting checkmated here. If I play a move like rook to f7, for example, white goes queen c6 check. If I go king d8, I just lose the rook, and after queen, queen to e1, white can now go king h2, queen to e5, king g2, Queen to e4 and very simply f3 queen e2 king g3 queen e1 and king g4 king f5 e6 or king f5 g6 and in this position the king is escaping and and white will be checkmating next move or in a couple of moves so i probably would have fallen into this and lost the game it's also worth noting if i play right if i go rook f7 checking king f8 then there's rook c8 king e7 rook to e8 winning the queen on e5 and white would win the game so Magnus used a bit of time here and steady plays rook to c7 after a three and a half minute think. It's worth noting, of course, after e5, I could take with the pawn. And after rook c7, king e8, queen c2, the game continues with queen d6. But as I said, I didn't see this queen c2 move at all. So this never would have happened. I would have just lost the game. Fortunately for me, Magnus made the check. I go king e8. And now white has to be careful because suddenly I'm threatening to win the game with queen takes pawn on f2. We get rook c8, king e7, Magnus trades, he goes queen h8, king f7, queen c8 here, trying to go for queen e6, and here I make a big mistake. I play this move queen e5. Now, for whatever reason, I rejected queen f4. I think I rejected it because I thought after queen e6, king f8, after white plays a move like a4, I didn't see my next move. Now, the reason I should have, or actually not a4, sorry, king g2, and I didn't see my next move, and I was really worried because for a split second, I did calculate g4, but I think after queen f5, this ending is winning. If I'm not mistaken, um, I go B5, B3, B4 takes, and I think this is winning for white. I'm not 100% sure, but I didn't want to spend all my time in the world trying to calculate this because, again, if I get low on time and this variation doesn't happen, then suddenly I'm just probably going to get flagged. So I played queen to e5 here, preventing queen e6 or queen f5. We get queen g4, king g6. I do think, by the way, here, queen b7 and queen c7 and queen takes b6 would have been very strong here. Again, after king f5, I still have pretty good chances to draw because the white king is completely open here, and there will be a lot of checks for my queen. Nonetheless, white is for choice. So instead, Magnus plays queen g4. I go king g6. We get king g2, king f6, a4 here. I go king e7, king f3. And now I make a howler by playing this move g6. Now, the reason I played g6 here was very simple. I wanted to make sure that there are no queen f5 or queen e6 moves, and both of these squares are covered. But the problem after g6 is now this move queen e6 is winning, simply because when we trade and white goes king g4, and I go king to e5, f3, king f6, white now has b3, and this is what we call in Deutsch, Zugzwang. I don't want to make a move here, but neither does White. But whoever's turn it is, is going to basically be in a lot of trouble here. If it's White's turn, maybe it's still a draw with King G3. Let me let me double check. Um, I guess it's still a draw with King G3. But if it's Black's turn in this position, like it is here, I have to move the King and after takes, King G7 and F4. White is simply winning, so I go King F7. There's F5 takes. White takes with the pawn. And after D5, there's King G4, King F6, King F4, D4, King E4. And after D3, takes, takes, King C4, King E5, King B5, King D4, takes, King C3, takes, takes, King B5. Pawn is guarded. Pawn runs down the board, becomes a queen, and I lose the game. So Magnus had the time here to try and figure it out, but he didn't. He, instead, he plays King E3. Now, it's worth noting also here, it's very important that without G6, this is a draw, by the way, because after here takes King G4, King F6, F3, I can slide the King to G6, and now I'm completely fine. So it's very critical that the pawn remains on G7, and I have this one square available for the King. So we get king e3, queen f6, king d3, king d8. Now at this point, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm only down 34 seconds on the clock, or 36 to be technical. And I, I think I have great chances. So I go king c7, king b7, hide the king here on the queen side with these pawns. King b3 is played, and I play queen d4. And already here, I thought I was in great shape. Because when Magnus had this position, he thought for a long time, and I was looking at king b1, king b3, and I thought queen d4 draws against both. If white goes king b1, queen d4 takes. I simply go check, king a2, queen a4, king b1, queen d1. And we, of course, have the classic right triangle. And if white tries to block with queen a3, I take the pawn on e4, and maybe I can even win this position. 
So he goes king b3, I play queen d4, he takes, I check, and he goes king a2. Now, here initially I thought queen d1 was a draw, but after king c3, I just could not figure out the draw. Now, apparently after queen f3, this is an easy draw, because if white goes king b4, takes king e5, for example, I can check. I think I can even take, and with this pass pawn on g5 running down the board, I'll never be in danger. But unfortunately, in this split second, since I didn't have a lot of time, and I don't want to spend like a minute here, because then I'm going to get flagged no matter what, I played queen d3. The only line that I calculated was queen to c1, king d3, and I think after check, I thought he could maybe go like king e3, run this king out, and I just didn't see it. Now, of course, as you guys can tell from the valuation bar, uh, black is completely fine, and there's a, a uh, not a perpetual, sorry, a repetition. Um, but I didn't want to burn my time. I didn't see it. So I thought, you know what? I'll play queen d3 because I was sure that in this position, even though I'm down a pawn, now this white king is stuck around these pawns and there has to be some way to save the game. So I played queen d4 here, threatening to checkmate in the corner pocket with queen a1. We get check, king a7, check. I go king a8, not king a6 because after queen c4 check, queens come off the board and then I'm just completely lost. There's a big white center here and these two pawns just roll right down the board. So I go king a8, Magnus plays queen c1, I play g4, which is a mistake here. I should have taken the pawn. Again, at this point, we're getting low on time. I'm not sure what's going on. And after this move, e5, I was very, very scared because now there are two connected pass pawns. White's just going to keep pushing p with like e6, e7. And apparently after queen d4, I'm still maybe okay. But with, with only 45 seconds, I can't do this because Magnus has instant moves and I don't have instant moves in reply and I'm just going to lose on time. So I played g4 here, idea that I want to capture the pawn, but now this pawn is only three squares away from the end of the board. So if I ever win this pawn, it, it should be enough. Magnus plays queen e1, I go king b7, and now he plays e5, I take, and he goes e6. And we have a very strange situation that doesn't occur often in queen and pawn endgames where, or it happens in rook and pawn endgames where a rook behind a pass pawn is very powerful. It doesn't happen so much in queen and pawn endgames, but here is a case where my king is one square too far away. So if I go king c7, e7, I cannot stop this pawn from getting to the end of the board. So in this position, I check, he goes king up b2, I play queen e7, queen e4, king c7, check, which apparently is a mistake here. Apparently queen e3, obvious, obvious move for humans is, is very good. Uh, he plays queen e5, I, I block, he checks, I go king c6, he takes the pawn, I, I play queen e5. Now apparently queen d4 here would have drawn the game, um, but at this point I just, I, I wasn't sure, so I play queen e5 and I go queen to e2. King a3, and now I play this move king to d6 here, trying to stop the white pawn from reaching the end of the board. Magus plays e7, I take, and now he plays this howler. Magus does a classic Botez gambit by hanging the queen with queen to f6. Now, Magus obviously made a mouse up at this point. He had like 25 seconds. I have like 15 seconds. I mean, we're getting down to a spot where it's going to be a massive time scramble. He meant to take the pawn on b6 because it guards the pawn on f2. But after queen to e5 here, threatening checkmate on a1, guarding the pawn on a5, we have another right triangle, and the game should be a draw, because if white goes king a2, I simply check. I just basically check the king forever, and there's no way out. And after king a2 check, king a3, I simply go back to e5, and once again, white could try to go queen b7, and then queen h1, but after queen c5 check, king moves, I take the pawn, I go g3 here, and there's no way that I can lose this with this pawn so far advanced. However, Magnus plays queen f6, and after king takes f6, he resigns the game, and I win the Armageddon, Armageddon game, and I win the match against Magnus Carlsen by a final score of 2-1. to one. So what does that mean? That means that tomorrow I will be playing in the finals against Fabiano Caruana. Now, since Fabiano has not lost a match, that means we play a standard match of four rapid games, 15 minutes, three-second increment, and I need to win this match. So we're tied and we go to Armageddon. I need to win the Armageddon game. And if I win that, then we play a second match. Since he hasn't lost and I've already lost one, where we'll play two games of Rapid and then potentially another Armageddon game as well. At any rate, I get the big win against the world champion Magnus Carlsen. I hope you guys have enjoyed this big recap from the match today. Very, very tense. Very exciting. Make sure to hit that subscribe button below if you haven't already. And we'll be back tomorrow with a recap after I play against Fabiano. And hopefully do not hang any more checkmate in once. See you guys soon. Bye.